amen. Hallelujah. Well, we've been in this study of messages entitled, uh, Your Life is Ministry. That's our study through 2 Corinthians. And listen, and I, I know and for sure that you've been blessed by the word that the Lord has been giving you through the preachers that have been coming to you. But uh, before I get started, I want to be faithful to a commitment I made to you uh, some time ago. But I, asked you, I said, every time I get up, I'm going to give you a quote for the week, right? I promise you I give you a quote for real. I'll be collecting all these quotes, and I promise you I will share with them. So let me give you this quote for this week, all right? Hallelujah. You, here, here, here's the quote for this week. It says, a person who will not command his or her thoughts will soon lose command of his or her actions. <laughs> a person who will not command his or her thoughts will soon lose command over his or her actions. Amen? Amen. Somebody asked me who quoted that. I said, well, if you Google it, you get two quotes, one from Thomas Wilson and another from Woodrow Wilson. Uh, I don't know who quoted who, but they say one of them two made, made, were the first to make this statement. He who has, does not have control over his or her thoughts will soon lose command or control over his or her actions. Amen? I hope that blesses you this week. In 2 Corinthians, as we've been going through this study, our theme, as I said before, has been your life is ministry, manners and methods. Manners in terms of our everyday activities and methods in terms of how we respond and deal with people. And when we outlined this chapter and we outlined this book, we told you that as we study this book, there are three subtitles that we're going to be working through. Uh, the first subtitle is entitled Racial Re Reconcili Relational Reconciliation. Relational Reconciliation. That deals with the first seven chapters of the book and that talks about how we need to reconcile our relationship with God as well as with one another in order that our life as ministry might have an effect for the kingdom as well as those around us. The second subtitle is entitled Relational Relief. That's in chapters 8 and 9. Now chapter 8 and 9 talks about how we need to be a blessing to the body through our gifts, our talents, and our treasures. Amen? And how we need to recognize that that's why God calls us to be a part of the body, to bring relief, to help us be able to maintain and go through and have the resources we need to do what God calls us to do. And then the third subtitle in this series is entitled Relational Reconciliation. That deals with verses 10 through 13, and that's talking about recognizing the gifts, the talents, the authority, and the, and, and the calling that God has upon all of our lives and giving recognition to that in order that we might operate in the body the way God would want us to operate and function with one another the, God, the way God wants us to function. So right now, in the present time, we're working through chapters 1 through 7. We're in chapter 4 today, concluding chapter 4. And that's under the subtitle of race, Relational Reconciliation. Relational Reconciliation. We've dealt with chapters 1 and 2 already, and that was about the ministry of comfort. How we were to be a comfort to one another. The reason why we go through our trials so we can learn how God comforts us. We share that same comfort with one another. Amen. And then we, in the last two chapters, chapters 3 and in 4, this has been dealing with what I call the ministry of glory. God would want us to understand not only is it that we are to give him glory, but God wants us to understand that we are to experience glory even while we are here. Amen? Amen. So as Paul works his way through this uh, uh, thing, God's new covenant infuses the gospel with dynamic and transforming power. And that's what we covered already in chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians. But therefore, Paul, as he goes on in his writing to this Corinthians church, he says, Paul neither loses heart or nor relies on anything other than the light that is shed by the gospel message that he has been given to preach and to teach to the Corinthian church. And we know Paul has been faithful in the preaching and teaching. Now, that is outlined in chapter 4, beginning at verses 1 through 6. But as he goes on in this chapter, he says, although he feels himself not so much to be merely just a clay vessel, weak and vulnerable. He, in verse chapter 4, reminds us that in this earthen vessel, in this clay vessel, there is a great treasure. God's greatest treasure abides in us. And that treasure is the gospel of Jesus Christ in the person and presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, that is covered in verses 7 through 12 of Romans, uh, of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Now, whatever the difficulties, whatever the setbacks, Whatever the troubles experienced in ministry, 
And Paul alludes to these things as means of distractions in our lives. Paul points out in the midst of those things, he still believes. His faith has not wavered. His belief has not changed. He is still strong in his belief, knowing that God in Christ and in that, in that confidence that he has, not only will he ensure that he will get to eternity, but also the believers in Corinthians will make it to eternity as well. That's found in verses 13 through 15. Now, with his eyes fixed on eternal truth, which can be experienced but not necessarily seen, Rather than, and rather than on the temporary setbacks and the momentary troubles that mark life on earth, Paul simply makes up his mind that he will not give up or give in. As a matter of fact, he is opening phrase of verse 16 says this, we do not lose heart. And that's where I want to draw our attention this morning. As we come to the last three verses of chapter four, that's where I want to set our focus. That's where I want us to talk about this morning as we move forward under the theme, uh, sub theme entitled relational reconciliation under the main theme, your life is ministry. In second Corinthians chapter four, turn that with me if you have it. Hallelujah. If you don't have it, God give you a minute to get there. First, second Corinthians chapter four. We're going to be looking at verse 16 through 18, reading from the New King James version of the Bible. Now, if you got it, put your finger there, take your Bible, hold it up. I don't know if you've done this since I've been gone, but I, I wanted to get back to it since I'm home and say with a very loud voice. I have the victory. And the victory is where? In my life as I apply God's word, because we just got finished singing, victory belongs to Jesus. <laughs> Amen. And so in first, second Corinthians chapter four, here, Paul, as he comes to the conclusion of this dissertation on glory uh, from for, uh, starting in chapter three, here in verse 16 and 18, he says this in verses 16 to 18, he says this. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. For while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen. I closed our reading with this quote I just uh, from Dr. Tony Evans' study Bible that, that kind of fits well with this verse. He says, if all you see is what you see, you will never see all there is to be seen. So I want to talk to you this morning from the subject, seeing the invisible. Seeing the invisible. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for your word this morning. We ask that you bless in these moments that we will share. Holy Spirit of God, we pray that you guide us now into all truth. Speak right now, we pray, for your servants are ready to hear. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Seeing the invisible. Hallelujah. Our, our title is somewhat of an oxymoron today. Uh, the definition of oxymoron is a figure of speech in which apparently contradictory terms appear in conjunction. Where contradictory terms appear in conjunction. And as the definition says, our title then is a contradictory in terms because, well, how can one see the invisible? When that is the meaning of the term. Invisible. You say it's invisible because you can't see it. And so, 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 so it implies that which cannot be seen. And yet what God would want us to understand from this text this morning, that for those of us who would follow and obey him, uh, and, and would, uh, and, 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 that he would enable them to be able to see what the human eye can't see. That God is, is, says that as we position ourselves to walk in the spirit, and not according to the flesh, that God would make the invisible visible to those 
who would choose to have their perspective changed by an intimate, consistent, and submissive relationship to him. Are you with me today? Because life in, 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 in this world in terms of ministry is already not easy. As believers in this world, we find it a challenge sometimes to do ministry in the world. The majority of people, because the majority of people in the world are blind and, 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 and folks are becoming more and more antagonistic when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, when it comes to ministry life, it becomes challenging to say the least. And especially if you're willing to stand for Jesus in a place where nobody else agrees. Amen. But the, here, Paul would want, and here we, is what we need to grasp, and I think God wants to hear. What, what we need to look at is what makes Paul so optimistic in the midst of all the challenges that even he faced in ministry during his time? What makes him so optimistic in believing that in spite of all the things he's already covered back in chapter 4, with all the setbacks, all the problems, all the trials and tribulations, what makes Paul so optimistic? And I believe it's because he has a settled conviction on the fact that what he is going through and what we are seeing before our eyes is only temporary. What makes him so optimistic is Paul is under the belief and strong conviction that no matter what he's facing, it ain't going to last long. It is not defining his life. It's only, it is only temporary. Listen, as we look at what he's dealing with in the church, is the Corinthian church challenged by disputes? Yes, it is. Is there people in the church that do ministry to make Paul miserable and to try to get on his nerves? Yes, there are. Are there people in the church who still deal with issues in their life, not, but not do it from a spiritual perspective? Absolutely. And yet in dealing with all of this as Paul dealing with in the churches that he has planted, Paul's posture is still a fact that it's temporary because he's not looking at them. He's looking at the faithfulness of God and recognizing that God is able even to save the unsaved and to deliver him even from this carnal situation. But key, the challenge is that Paul wants us to understand that in this posture, as he stands in this place, God allows him to see what nobody else can see. God, God allows him to view what nobody else can view. And what Paul is trying to help us understand today, that that's not just exclusive to him. It's exclusive to anybody who would, choose, who would choose to believe and to walk by faith and trust him. So there are three things in this text that I want to highlight that we need to understand if we want to see the invisible. As a matter of fact, there are three things in this text that not only do we need to understand, but we need to practice if we're going to be able to see the invisible on a consistent basis. You know, God ain't, God ain't not wanting you, God is not wanting you to see the invisible every once in a while. <laughs> God wants you to see the invisible consistently. And, and, and understanding these principles is one thing. Practicing them is another. Amen. And so there are three things that, that need to happen that we need to understand. The first thing that Paul points out in the text that we need to understand is that, we, first of all, there must be a declaration of intent. There must be a declaration. Of, we need to understand that as we're facing the issues of our life and the world today, you have, must have already made a declaration of intent on how you're going to respond to those things. And not only do you need to understand the declaration of intent, you need to practice the declaration of intent. The second thing that, that enables you to be able to see the invisible is Paul says in this text that you need to make decisions about the incidents. Now, what, what, what do you mean? I, what, the incidents that I'm referring to, I'm talking about the afflictions, the trials, the tribulations, the persecution, the challenges that you are facing in your life. You need to make a decision about those before they happen. And Paul in the text tells you what your posture ought to be when it comes to these incidents. 
So that's the second thing that enables you to see the invisible is making the decision about the instant. The third thing that you need to understand in order to be able to see the, uh, see the invisible is you got to make a determination of insight. You got to decide what you're going to look at and what you ain't going to look at. <laughs> because the biggest problem for us is we get ourselves a whole lot of trouble based on what we see. Amen, lights. So let's back up and I'll break them down for you just for a moment and I'll let you go home. Is that all right? First of all, he says, in order to be able to see the invisible, the first thing that has to happen is you need to make a declaration of intent. Look at what he says in verse 16. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Paul's first declaration of intent is this. His first declaration, I intend not to be discouraged. Because he said, therefore, we do not lose heart. Amen. That phrase can be translated. We don't give up. We don't quit. We don't sit down. We don't compromise. We don't renege. We don't back down. Paul is saying his first declaration of intent is that he is not going to allow himself to get discouraged by what is going on around him. Now, now, this is not the first time Paul makes this statement in the text. Matter of fact, you go back to verse one. Paul says in verse one of chapter four, he says this. Therefore, since we have this ministry. What ministry? Well, he had just finished in chapter three talking about. All the things that God had blessed him with in terms of glory. And now that he recognizes that he has this ministry, he says the price, he said that what motivates him not to give up is because God has given him a ministry. And listen to that. And listen to what he says. When we have this ministry, as we have been, have received mercy. So what motivates Paul not to give up is not only that God has given him a ministry, but God has given a ministry through uh, based on mercy. In other words, God has shown mercy to Paul and giving him an opportunity to serve him in spite of what Paul had been doing and part of what because you understand what mercy is now. Mercy is giving you what you don't deserve. No, 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 not no, no, take that back. Mercy is not allowing you to get what you do deserve. Grace is giving you what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Are you with me now? And Paul says, since God has given me a ministry and not given me what I deserve. Because I deserve death because I killed the saints. I persecuted the saints. I chased them all over the place. I was trying to wipe out the church when God delivered me. And he showed mercy because he gave me. So since I've got this ministry based on the mercy of God, look at what he says in the last half of verse 1. I do not lose heart. In other words, I'm not going to give up on it. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to be ashamed. I'm not going to be afraid. We don't lose heart. Amen. So the first declaration implies that of intent is that I'm not going to get discouraged. Paul says in Galatians chapter 6 verse 9, he says this, he says, and let us not grow weary in doing good. How many know you can get tired doing good? Especially when you're not appreciated for it. Especially when it seems like people are taking advantage of you for it. You know how you can get tired. Because it's some, so you get, especially with some folks who are uh, unkind and ungrateful. And, and, and you, you know you're doing it out of goodness of your heart, but they think you ought to do it. <laughs> Makes you want to stop. You, you don't want to help nobody like that. But the Bible says those are the very ones you should help. Bless those who curse you yeah, yeah. and those, those who persecute you, who say all manner of evil against you faultless. Be happy. Be blessed are you, for great is your... So listen, God still expects you to serve and be kind and be good and do good things, representing his presence and character in the lives of those who take your goodness for granted. Because you get tired. Paul said, let us not be weary in well-doing. Well, he, said, he says, look at what he says in text. He goes on and says, because for in due season, you will reap. Your goodness, kindness is not going to be in vain. If you can hang in there, 
you keep on doing good, the good, the, the, the benefits going to come. You're going to reap because it's not in vain. It's not going to be for nothing. Even though the world might look like you're getting taken advantage of, God knows what he's doing and God's going to bless you for the good you do. If you just keep on doing good. He said, because the key thing is that you're going to reap. And then the last part of the verse says, if you don't lose heart. King James Version says, if you faint not. <laughs> if you don't give up. If you don't get discouraged. If you don't get frustrated. If you don't get despondent. If you don't get mad because they ain't receiving and acting right because of your kindness, if you don't lose heart, God will bless you. Listen, Paul understood this as it relates to seeing the invisible because the key to seeing the invisible is that you got to have a mindset that no matter what you go through, you're going to stay in there for Jesus. You got to have a mindset that no matter what you go through, you ain't going to quit on Jesus. You got to have a mindset that no matter what you go through because he didn't give up on you, you ain't going to give up on him. Paul says the first declaration of intent is that I will not be discouraged. The second declaration of intent says that I will not be distracted. It said, though our outward man is perishing. <laughs> That's a good distraction when you look at what's going on on the outside and it, ain't, it don't look like it used to. Don't feel like it used to. Don't act like it used to. <laughs> Yeah, that can get real, not only just discouraging, it can become a distraction. Oh, yeah, we're we, we, we trying to pump it up, tie it up, push it up. Amen. Stretch it up. Yeah, we, and some of us get obsessed with it. Uh, can't stand no gray hair. Go get the coloring real quick. God, oh, no, ain't no way, no gray hair. Get obsessed with it. It can become a distraction. And Paul says, though this outward man is perishing, because James reminds you in James chapter 1, verse 11, the grass withered and the flower fade. I don't care how much you push it up, it's going to keep coming down. <laughs> Sometimes I look in the mirror and I see some of these lines and some of these wrinkles, and I look at behind these eyes and say, I still feel like I'm 16, but I don't look like it. <laughs> The grass withers. Flower fades. Because this thing, no matter how hard, and if, you, and if you let it, the devil will let it become a distraction. It'll, let, it'll keep you from the focus of what God called you to do and keep you from seeing what God wants you to see because you get so distracted because of the outward man's appearance and because what's not just the outward man, just what's going on around you and what's happening around you. And that's what the enemy wants you to do. Paul mentions this distraction back in verses 7 through 10. He talked about it in, in verse 7 when he made the comment. He says this, we have this treasure in earth and vessels that the excellency of the power of God may be of God and not of us. So first of all, he wants to understand that what we need to focus on is not this clay vessel and this building and this house where the glory of God is. What we need to focus on, on the, is the glory of God that's in us because the glory of God that's in us is what's going to sustain us to the end. Because the enemy will want to get you so distracted. He says, because he puts on in verse 8, for we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed, not distracted. We are perplexed, but not despaired, not distracted. Because persecuted, but not forsaken, not distracted. Struck down, but not destroyed, not distracted. Always carrying in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our body. Listen, this, this, this old building that we're in is going to fade. It's got to. Because how I'm going to get in the new building if I keep staying in the old one? And God didn't promise me. He done made a house not made with hands. Eternal in the heavens. It's for me. Hallelujah. You want to talk about that in chapter 5. Amen. But we got to understand that the enemy, when we get so caught up on the physical, that I forget to see what God's doing in the spiritual. And I forget to see what God wants me to see from the spiritual. Paul says there's a declaration of, that I will not be distracted. There's a declaration that I will not be um, uh, discouraged. A third is a declaration that I will not, the declaration of intent, I will not be disillusioned. He says, for the inward man is being renewed. Day by day. See, the devil wants to distract me so I can be disillusioned 
about what God is doing in me. And I, and I begin to discount and discredit what God is doing in me. Because understand that even as I'm going through this, God is working in me to make me into who he has ordained for me to be. It's not by accident or just in a vacuum that I'm ch being challenged and facing the trials and going through the things in life that I'm going through because God reminds me that in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome. You're not going to stay in it always, but understand God's got a purpose in it, and he's doing something in you. That inward man, how would I know? Andre Cross put it this way. How would I know that God could solve a problem if I never had a problem? How would I know that God could bring me out if I'd never been in something? God allows me to go through this so that my inward man could get strong in faith, get strong in confidence, get strong in, in understanding who God is and see the invisible hand of God move in my life in circumstances that seem to be absolutely impossible for me to work out on my own. And the goal of the enemy is to get you disillusioned, to think that you're just going through this by yourself. God don't care. God, there ain't no purpose in this. There's no reason for this. And yet, Judge Paul says, I'm coming to understand that as I'm going through these challenges and I don't allow them to discourage me and I don't allow them to distract me, God is working in me, his will and his goal and his purpose. And I'm being renewed day by day and moment by moment. And I can't and I will not let these circumstances disillusion me from seeing God do what he's doing. First thing I got to do if I'm going to see the invisible, is to make a declaration of intent. I got intent not to be discouraged. I got intent not to be distracted. And I got intent not to be disillusioned. But not only that, then I need to move to this next phase because I need to make a decision about the incidents, about these things that I go through all the time, these afflictions, these challenges, these trials. Because he says in the next part of the verse, in verse 17, he says this, he says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Can I, can I say this to you? This is a matter of perspective. What Paul is telling us right now is a matter of perspective. How you going to view what you going through. Because he said these light afflictions are but for a moment, but they're working for us a far more exceeding eternal way of life. There are three things Paul is telling us that are perspective. He's not leaving it up to you to determine what the perspective is. He's telling you what your perspective should be right here in the text. So when it comes to the challenges, when it comes to the problems, when it comes to the trials, when it comes to the affliction, when it comes to the persecution and all the stuff the world, the flesh and the devil throws at you. Paul said your first perspective on those things is that you consider them mild. Another word for light is mild. They ain't heavy. They ain't overwhelming. Although they feel like it. And sometimes they look like it. But it's perspective now, y'all. It's not about reality. It's about perspective. It's not about what it really is. It's about perspective. Are you, are you following me? Because you can get caught up with what it really is, and that'll, that'll take you down. Some of them have been pulled in the holes by dealing with reality because we failed to look at it for, look, we're looking at it for what it is, not for what God is over it. And God, Paul is telling you that when you face them, first thing you got to understand is that they're mild. Why mild? Well, because Jesus had already told you in John 16, 33, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome. The reason they can be mild is because he already told me I got victory in it. Because he overcame it, and because he overcame it, he's going to bring me through it. Because I'm in him. Amen. And victory is in Jesus. Remember, it belongs to him. And if I'm in him, I have the victory because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So Paul says, first reason you, they ought to be mild to you is because Jesus already told you, even though you're going to face them, you got victory. Okay, the other reason why is because he done told you you ain't got to carry them by yourself. First Peter chapter 5, verse 7, cast your cares on me because he cares for you. L- l- listen, when it gets too heavy, I can give it to Jesus. When it gets too overwhelming, I can, I can cast it on Jesus. I can lay it at his feet. My biggest problem, though, is when I get to on my knees to give it to him, when I get up, I take it back. I carry it with me. Yeah, I, 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 I worry about it. I fret over it. I wonder what God going to do. And, then, and then, well, God can't do that because I didn't give it to him. Because <laughs> when I start worrying about it, I took it back. But he says, cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. So it's like because he can carry it. It's like because he promised me in Matthew, my yoke is easy and my burdens are light. He, he told me this light in my yoke because he didn't allow me to go through this by myself. He says, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. So he will not leave me nor forsake me or let me down. So I'm not going through this by myself, although the devil wants to convince me that I am. But the Bible says my perspective is based on who he is and what he says. And it tells me these things are mild. And, and the last and final reason, they are mild because of Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, the reason why I can't handle it it's because I'm not relying on the strength of Jesus. I'm still relying on mine. Reason why it gets overwhelming? Because I'm trying to do this myself. The devil done convinced me and deceived me into thinking, this is your problem. You better handle it. <laughs> yeah. And the more you handle it, the worse it gets. Amen. And what you should have did is cast it on Jesus and then remind yourself, I can make it to do this because of the strength of Jesus. So, Jesus, this is on you, bro. This is on you. Take it, Lord. It's in your hands. I'm going to follow you, do what you tell me you, but you've got this. It's, you, but the perspective is, it's my own. When you start declaring it's overwhelming, it's going to be overwhelming. When you start declaring it's hard, it's going to get hard. When you start, tech, you start declaring, I can't handle it, you definitely can't handle it. When you start declaring, he's light. Oh, Lord, thank you. Mild. Guess what? It's going to be mild. Because your, your focus won't be on it. It'll be on him. Amen. But not only did he tell your perspective ought to be that it's mild, your perspective ought to be that it's momentary. Are but for a moment. That's what it says. These light afflictions, which are but for a moment. Which are but for a moment. Not the rest of your life or a moment. Not to destroy your life, but for a moment. To not overwhelm your life, but for a moment. So what does that mean? They in it, this not intended to last all. Young people are making a permanent decision over a temporary problem when they take their life because it seems overwhelming right now. And you got to understand, that's how the devil kills, steal, and destroy. He convinces people that in the midst of their turmoil, in the midst of their struggles, in the midst of their problems, it is seemingly so overwhelming that this is what their life is going to be for the rest of their life. And when they adopt and believe that perspective, the idea becomes, then why should I stay here? And God wants to remind you, I don't care what the affliction is, it's only for a moment. If you can hang in there, keep your eyes on him, trust him, call on some folks to hold your arms up and to help you, it's not going to last. But then you got to understand why. Because that's ain't that the question you all want to ask? Then why am I going through this? You got to understand the why. Paul tells you the why. Yes, he does. He tells you why. Because not only that you need to, your perspective needs to be mild and your perspective needs to be that they're momentary, what you need to look at when you're going through these things or when you're facing these afflictions because you will go through them, that they are maneuvering. I'm going to give you that word again. 
They are maneuvering. They are positioning you. Working for you a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. See, 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 the only reason God allows it is not even so much to punish you as it is to maneuver you in the position for not only his glory to be manifested in your life, but you to experience his glory in your life. God don't allow you to go through things in a vacuum. There's a purpose. God's intent for you, allowing you to go through these light afflictions, these mild afflictions, which are momentary, and they will come because they're momentary, but while you're in it for the moment, God is using it to maneuver you, to position you, to create in you a place so you can become who he wants you to be so he can bless you, so he can set his glory in you, so you can experience his glory in his li- in your life. Your trial ain't for nothing. Your challenge ain't in a vacuum. Your perspective might be off. That's, that's a matter of, of, of course, that's a matter of thought change. Hearing God and changing your thought and thinking the way he wants you to think. That's the issue there, but it still doesn't hinder God's purpose of what he's doing in your life to maneuver you in the position where he will bless you and manifest his glory in your life and on his behalf. Because it's based on how you decide about these incidents. That's the second thing. Because if I'm going to see the invisible, my decision about these incidents in my life is that they are mild, that they are momentary, and God is using them to maneuver me in the position so he can bless me. And when you start thinking that way about your problems, the devil can't handle you. Because his goal is to try to cause fear and discouragement and doubt so he can kill, steal, and destroy in your life. But if you tell, every time he tells you, man, that's heavy, you say, no, that ain't, that's mine. You know, that's going to be the rest of your life. No, it's not this momentary. But God's using it to destroy you. No, he ain't. He's using it to put me in position so he can bless me. And when you answer his arguments with that, he ain't got nothing else to do but leave you alone. Because he can't convince you to believe the lie. So if I'm going to see the invisible, I've got to make a declaration of intent. If I'm going to see the invisible, I've got to make a decision about the incidents. And third and finally, if I'm going to see the invisible, I've got to make a determination about the insight. Listen to what he says in the last verse of the text that we're looking at this morning, verse 18. For he says this, for while we do not look, while we do not look, while we do not look at the things which are seen, for the things which are seen, as he says, for things which are, uh, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, and the things which are not seen are eternal. If the second point was about a matter of perspective, the second point is a matter of practical perspective. The first one was mental perspective, mild, momentary, maneuvering. The third set last is practical perspective, how I walk this out daily. And it's about function and about focus. Paul says function first. He says, here's my function. While I do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Paul says, first of all, I make a decision what I'm going to look at. The function of my everyday life is I'm going to focus on what is not seen rather than focus on what is seen. Let me help you. The Bible calls me as a believer four times throughout Scripture to walk by faith. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. That's my daily function. I am to walk by faith day by day and moment by moment. Well, we have come to, a, I believe, an erroneous conclusion regarding faith because we have, have, have stated and been taught in some situations that fear kills faith. That's not biblical. 
Let me help you. It's not. Because the Bible says, perfect love casts out fear. So what hinders love is fear. <laughs> what keeps me from loving you and keeping me from loving you the way God wants me to love you is fear that you might take advantage of my love. It's fear that you might not deserve it. It's fear that I might not get it back. It's fear that I believe that, that, that you don't deserve it. God says perfect love deals with fear. So then what hinders faith? 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Bible says walk by faith, not by what hinders faith. It's what I see. I tend to believe what I see more than what he says. So the devil trips me with my sight. Because he gets me looking at the thing and making it look like it's impossible. Therefore, it keeps me from having faith that God could do anything different. And the more I look at it, the more real it is, the more evident it is, the more I tend to believe it. Because I see it. And yet God says, I'm able. God says, I can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ever ask. And God says, there is nothing too hard for me. God says, I can call. Listen, if you believe me, I can bring it out of existence. God says, I'm able. But the devil said, but that show don't look like it, does it? The, the, the situation, the more you keep calling on faith, look like it's just getting worse. Look like it's getting worse. Look like it, don't it? Look at it. Because the whole object of function is God calls me to walk by faith. And the enemy trips my faith based on what it's And Paul said, I am not going to look at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen. Because that function helps him to keep his eye on God so he can see what God wants to show him that the human eye can't see. Paul says, I know there's something going on behind the scene. I know that God is moving and working out his will. I don't see it in my physical eye, but I know it in my spirit. So I'm going to keep looking for it with my physical eye, what I know in my spirit to be real and to be true. And God will enable you. If you walk by faith to look for what's not seen, to see what is not seen. That's a daily function. You got to wake up in the morning determined, I'm going to look for God's hand. Not for the circumstance or situation. I'm going to look for God. Because if, if I'm a believer, then I got to believe that God is moving in every circumstance or situation in my life. And he is. And the question is, I got to look for it. I got to make up my mind. I want to see it. And I, keep, I ask God, show me your hand, God. Every day, show me how you're moving. So I don't get caught up with what the devil wants me to see. I can only see what you want me. You see, it's a function. It's a function, and then it's a focus. Because the last part of the verse says, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. I'm closing. But let me, let me close with this. What you need to adapt in your focus is that you and I are no longer temporal beings. We are eternal beings. When you got saved, when you accepted Jesus, when, you, when God filled you with the Spirit, your existence no longer is on a temporary plane. Bible says you are seated with him in heavenly places. That you are heirs and joint heirs of the kingdom of God. And the thing that kills our faith and our sight is the devil keeps trying to trip us up with making us think that our eternal existence is going to happen when we die. 
than realizing that our eternal existence and we who are as a beings are eternal the moment we got saved. When I was a kid, I used to like all those supernatural shows with the supernatural human beings and doing the supernatural feats and all the supernatural things. I used, to, I used to crave watching those programs, and deep down inside as a kid, I'd be wondering and wishing if I could do some of that supernatural stuff. I remember one day in prayer, I was having a reflection on watching shows like Superman and, 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 and Mighty Mouse. I don't know if y'all know, I'm dating myself now. And looking at all these folks that can do all these superhuman strength feats and all this supernatural stuff. And God whispered in my ear one day, that's who you are now. You are a supernatural being living in a natural world because my presence in you makes you supernatural. And listen, and listen, the mindset of somebody who's supernatural they're different from somebody who's natural. Because when somebody is natural, there's a whole lot of stuff that you question whether you can do or not. But when you're supernatural and you understand your supernatural ability and you're clear about your supernatural power, you ain't scared of nothing. No weapon formed against me. <laughs> I'm the head and not the tail. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I'm able to tread on the scorpion and on the serpent and on all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall any means hurt me. I can resist the devil and he will flee from me because of who is in me. Supernatural being that made me supernatural enables me to walk in a supernatural way. If I would just walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. Listen, if you've accepted him, then accept who you are. You're supernatural. If you haven't accepted him, you're not excluded. Because all you got to do is decide today. If you want to accept this supernatural God who will make you supernatural and take you from earth to heaven. God wants us to see the invisible, but it requires a declaration, a decision, and a determination to want to see what he sees and to see ourselves the way he sees us. Not as natural, but as supernatural. All his bow and all eyes closed. Our Father, our God, we thank you for the word that gives life, gives revelation, and gives understanding. Today, you wanted to broaden our perspective, not just on who you are in us, but who we are to you and who we are as it relates to the world. God, we thank you today for your word. We ask you to help us to apply its principles and its truths in our lives, in our circumstance, in our situations, that the fruit of your word may produce in us what you have, inten what you have intended for us even before we were born, that your glory might be manifested, your power might be on display in our lives, and that we would become who you have ordained us to be. And those around us will see you for who you, is, for who you are in us and through us. God, we pray that as we elevate our sight and stop looking at what's in front of us and start looking at you. When we elevate our sight and stop looking at what's temporal but what is eternal. That in that elevation of sight, not only will we see you, but in your eyes we will see the true reflection of who we are to you. Thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the way you love us and for the way you desire us to experience everything.
that you have planned for us from the foundations of the world. Thank you. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, if you are here this morning and you want to move from the temporal to the eternal, if you want to experience what we've been talking about in terms of this word today and, and really begin to see yourself and experience yourself in the true creation in which God had made you and what God has designed you and what God has called you to, the decision is yours. God leaves that up to you. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. He says, but as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the children of God. And he says, to many as received him. That means you and I need to make a decision to receive him. Each one who has received him made that decision. So it's your turn. If you haven't made it yet, today, God has ordained this moment to be your time to decide if you're ready to make that decision or not. If you're ready to decide and receive him, he says, if you do, you will become a child of God. And in so doing, you will experience salvation. For the Bible says, who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you're here and that's what you want to do, as every head is bowed and every eye is closed, all I'm going to ask you to do as an act of faith, as a sign of your intent and your declaration of determination and sight and decision, that you just simply raise your hand and put it down. That's all I'm asking you to do. I just want to see who you are so I can pray with you and pray for you. But you said, Pastor, that's me. I'm ready to make that de declaration intent. I don't know him. I haven't made a decision for him, but I want to make one today. And I want to I want to receive him so that I can become a child of God. Just lift your hand up and put it down. That's all you got to do. Hallelujah. I see one hand. Is there another? Is there? I see another one. Is there another? Hallelujah. I see another. I see another. Amen. I see another. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? I see your sweetheart. Anyone else? Well, as you raise your hand, listen. This next step is simple. In order for Christ to become Lord of your life, in order for you to become a child of God, it's just simply prayer. Simply a prayer. You, you simply pray and ask him to come in. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. It's, the prayer itself is not the formula. The key is that you make the words I share with you your words. You are sincere from your heart. Don't talk to me. You talk to God. And when, if you are sincere, when this prayer is over, you will be saved. You will be a child of God. So simply say to the Lord at this moment, say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I open the door of my life and I receive you as my Savior and my Lord. Take control of my life. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your spirit. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a clap. Listen, if you prayed that prayer and you meant what you said, welcome to the family. You're saved. You're on your way to heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is a, a card in the back of the chair in front of you with a QR code on it. If you will take that card and scan that QR code, it's going to tell you what you need to do next. Amen. We want to walk with you. We want to encourage you. We got some gifts for you as a result of your decision today. Just scan that code and follow steps. And I promise you that in the next 48 hours, somebody from our church office is going to contact you and talk with you about your next steps. Welcome to the family. Come on, Ecclesia. Let's bless those who have made this decision. And listen, and listen, do me a favor. If you may pray that prayer today, just tell somebody when you leave, I'm a part of the family now. That's all you got to say. As I'm a part of, just say that to anybody and watch them rejoice with you. I'm a part of the family now. Amen. Hallelujah. Have you been blessed this morning? Hallelujah. I have been too. Let's all stand now and let's prepare to leave. God is good. 
and he's good all the time. Amen. Hallelujah.